Anything. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Order. There is still some honourable senators standing. Would they resume their seats or leave the chamber? Order. Getting very Order. The question is that the bill stand is printed. Senator Lees. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I seek leave to move amendments 2, 3 and 4 from the original running sheet of amendments together. Is leave granted to move the three together? Leave is granted. I so move and just briefly explain that these amendments give the option to the recipient when he or she wants payment of farmhouse support to start after a successful review of a decision. and uh, either, That is either on the day of the new decision or uh, eligibility can be, can be backdated. If they choose backdated, as in the legislation now, they'd get a lump sum payment. Uh, if they choose from the new decision, they would effectively have their time extended. And uh, this is because of the delays, and the delays at some stage are up to 12 months, we're told, in the Department of Social Security applications and appeals processes. And that's despite what promises they've been making recently about efficiencies. And so this is an important option. Otherwise, the grant period could effectively be over before the farmer knows if he or she is actually qualified for farm household support. Senator Turner. Uh, <coughs> Mr Chairman, the, the coalition position on these amendments um, is clear. The bill states, clause 20, page 10, sub clause 2, that if a person is knocked back and the person applies for a review within three months and the review is successful, the determination takes effect on the day on which the previous decision took effect. The Democrats want the person to have a choice of starting back then or from the day of the new determination is made. Why would a farmer want to knock back back pay in those circumstances? Clause 20, page 10, sub clause 3, simply says that if you take more than 30 days to apply for a review, the new determination dates from the date you applied. The Democrats want a choice of that date or the day on which the new determination is made. Again, why would farmers want to knock back back pay? Clause 30, page 10, sub clause 4, simply says that if the person was not notified on being unsuccessful, then the person can apply for a review and, if successful, it will date from the day of the previous decision took effect. Again, the Democrats want to allow the person to scrap the back pay. Why would they want to do this? They probably have been borrowing money or friends to stay afloat. The Honourable the Minister. Uh, well, for much the same reason that has been put. I mean, there, is a, there is no incentive to opt for anything other than the best return, and the best return is available now. And uh, uh, one can appreciate there is a choice, but the choice is not worth taking in any circumstances. It doesn't seem to us that. It, Therefore, is as important as it's been presented, and uh, we would oppose the amendment. The question is: the amendments be agreed to? Those that appear to say aye. Contrary, no. I think the noes have. Them. Senator Lees. I seek leave to move the remaining amendments. That is six, seven, eight, nine, fourteen, and fifteen together. Is leave granted for those to be moved together? Leave is granted. Senator Lees. I so move and uh, briefly explain that these amendments are related to penalties for not complying with directions to provide information. In other words, for things like not sending back forms on time, the penalties are rather are very draconian at six months imprisonment and 12 months imprisonment for not providing information or providing misleading information respectively. We believe that they really are ridiculously harsh for the offences they represent and uh, the amendment seeks to re reduce the penalties to $250 and $1,000, respectively. Senator Tamworth. Uh, Mr Chairman, um, the penalties under the Social Security Act include imprisonment for two years if the person is guilty of an offence. Therefore, the penalties under this legislation, that is imprisonment of up to 12 months, is not unduly harsh. I understand that uh, there um, is a move to have a consistency between this legislation, uh, the Social Security legislation and the, the Crimes Act legislation. And I would certainly ask the minister to, to confirm that it is the intention of the government uh, to have the penalties 
uh, between all three uh, drawn into a, into a common consistency. The Honourable the Minister. Yes, uh, I confirm the remarks of Senator Tambling. It is intended to make these consistent uh, across all of the three departments. Um, I point out as well that these are up to, these aren't uh, penalties that must be applied, and clearly there's judicial discretion to decide what punishment fits the crime in the given set, set of circumstances peculiar to the case. So uh, uh, with those, for those reasons, we, uh, we don't support the amendment. The question is the amendments be agreed to. Those that can say aye. Contrary, no. I think the no's have it. The question is that the bill stand is printed. Those that have opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The committee will now consider the equal Income Equalisation Deposit Laws Amendment Bill 1992. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection and is so ordered, the question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those Oh, the question is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Chairman of Committee, Senator Colston, reports that the committee has considered the Rural Adjustment Bill 1992 and three related bills and agreed to them without amendments or requests. Minister? I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Minister? I move that the bills be read a third time. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Clark? Rural Adjustment Bill 1992, States Grants Rural Adjustment Amendment Bill 1992, Farm Household Support Bill 1992, Income Equalisation Deposits Laws Amendment Bill 1992. Government Business Order of the Day number 5, Natural Resources Management Financial Assistance Bill. Second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Tamley. Madam um, Acting Deputy President, President, the Natural Resources Management Financial Assistance Bill 1992 brings within one piece of legislation the authority for the Commonwealth to develop integrated approaches to land, water and associated vegetation management issues with community groups, the states and territories and other organisations. At the moment, much of the Commonwealth finance for land care is channelled through the states, and in many cases the states have used it to finance their previously state-funded soil conservation offices. While the Administration for Water, Land and Related Vegetation programs is through the Department of Primary Industries and Energy, the different legislation means programs are confusing and lack coordination. The Government circulated a discussion paper in April this year to key groups and the Government claims the comments supported a more integrated approach to natural resource management. Recently the Federal Government obtained agreement from, the, from state governments to combine the Ministerial Councils of Agriculture, Water Resources and Soil Conservation to ensure that a more comprehensive focus to federal and state policy discussion occurred in these areas. In the Minister's second reading speech on the Natural Res Resources Management Financial Assistance Bill, there were some positive aims. <coughs> on the basis of these positive aims, the Coalition is prepared to support the bill and to monitor the progress of the consolidated arrangement. The first proposal in the bill that the minister refers to is his aim to combine the ministerial councils for agriculture, water and soil. The aim is to provide a more comprehensive or integrated approach to these related aspects of sustainable development in agriculture, which is certainly worthwhile. Part of that broad proposal is to merge the National Soil Conservation Program and the Federal Water Resources Assistance Program into the one, and that is basically the content of this bill. The budget for this year is to be $77 million. We are talking here generally about what is commonly known to the ordinary person as land care. There are really separate programs. There is a separate land care limited, a private company that is in a very positive way getting in the private sector finance, company finance, to further promote the total soil conservation and land care ethics. 
and there are the, the water programs that are concerned with salinity, high water tables, etc. They have their own community groups separate from the land care groups. Community groups all have the aim of raising community awareness of soil, water and vegetation problems. They concentrate on community programs more than they do on particular problems on actual farms. That is where the major action actually has to occur on the farms themselves. If these changes or this consolidation of legislation simplify the application procedures and reduce the administrative delays and costs, the change will be positive because there has been confusion and complaints about this in the past. There has been a further problem in the past where the finance from those two programs has gone via the states or through the state system and where the states themselves have been the recipients of the programs. The aim in the minister's second reading speech of the third element of this proposal, the partnership agreements, which is where the minister can make comment if he feels that this is not right, will hopefully overcome or reduce this weakness of states who do not maintain in real terms their expenditure that existed in these areas prior to the federal government's assistant arrangements commencing. The states would be required to maintain in real terms their own expenditure at the same time, and this is sometimes the opposite part of the problem. Not establishing too much duplication at the federal level with regard to checking how the money is spent, applications and so on. Land care, in broad terms, has been bipartisan and continues to be bipartisan. But there have been times recently at particular functions when the original arrangement has not been maintained, when there has not been recognition of the bipartisan nature. The member for Murray and the shadow minister um, for primary industry, Mr Bruce Lloyd, in his second reading speech in the House of Representatives, voiced his concern that the level of budgetary provision for land care remains flat. In fact, it is declining in real terms. With this comes another problem. That is, if one looks at just the last three years of expenditure, at the expenditure estimated for a financial year as proposed in the budget for that year, and the figures in the budget documents for the following year which show what was actually spent, one sees that they are quite different figures. For example, in the year 1990-91, the budget estimate was $88.5 million. The actual spending, $73.5 million. In 1991-92, the budget estimate was $70.8 million, the actual spending $60.2 million. This year's budget for 92-93, the minister refers to $77 million. I would hope that very close to that $77 million would be spent in this important area. When one looks at the decade of land care and the figure for the National Soil Conservation Section of around $25 million a year for each of those 10 years in real terms, the actual commitment is declining. We have to do better than that for the remaining years of the decade of land care. For a start, we have a number of land care groups. There are now many other types of groups as well as those referred to as land care groups. In fact, there are over 1,300 of them. They have increased dramatically. Presumably, there will be further increases. While the money they, they may, may want may not be able to be provided, there obviously is a continuing and growing commitment in this area. Separate to this and additional to it is the real problem of encouragement to farmers for, in some cases, quite costly on-farm remedial measures. This is where Section 75D of the Income Tax Assessment Act has been quite important. This government has, in some locations in Australia, removed some of the tax incentives for on-farm works, for soil conservation or for irrigation improvement. However, the write-off in the year of expenditure for lasering and related measures has never, was never removed. This has been tremendously important. There have been some anomalies that have been subsequently sorted out concerning tree planting and fencing, and some things that have been clarified and improved again in recent years. In some areas of Australia, farmers have spent up to $25 million in some difficult years, and now close to 50 per cent of the total irrigation area of areas such as northern Victoria will be covered with these improvements. That is a tremendous achievement. That really is doing more to help in the, in the slow but sure improvement in the quality of Murray River water from that part of the state in the sense of drainage of irrigation water that goes into the Murray than anything that has been done by communities through land care groups, SPAC groups, the salinity program action groups, or whatever we like to call them. They are tremendous groups, all of them. The point 
That is, the real action is and always will have to be on the farms themselves. Any on-farm activities are very expensive. We talk thousands of dollars for any worthwhile project. If there is a low cash flow, it is very difficult, even with Section 75D tax deductibility, to write off in the year of expenditure to provide any real incentive. We have a challenge here to provide incentives and encouragement for those on-farm practices so they may proceed to a greater degree than they have so far. The future of sustainable agriculture in these areas, and for that matter in dry land areas or wherever it may be in Australia, has to be addressed. The land care programs and so forth, which provide community awareness, which do very good things and have to be maintained in real terms. Additional policies or programs need to be put in place to ensure that more farmers are encouraged to do what they themselves would naturally want to do, that is to improve the state of their farms so that every farmer would want they can leave the farm to the next generation or sell it to whoever they wish in a better sustainable position than when they started. Madam uh, Acting Chairman, I would, I would like to um, deviate slightly from this legislation to an, another matter that has been drawn, a related matter that has been drawn to my attention today. And that is a press release by the Environment Centre Northern Territory, which has been released by the campaign's coordinator, Mr Jamie Pittick in which he blatantly attacks an outstanding company operating in the Northern Territory, Zappapan. Zappapan NL is a respected company who, in all dealings with government and environmental groups with regard to the Mount Todd gold mine, have used the correct process of approval of this project. This disgraceful press release has only been released today but includes some of the following statements by Mr Pittick with regard to the draft environmental impact statement conducted for the Mount Todd gold mine. And I quote, The supplement is a cynical exercise in deceiving the public into believing the endangered Goldian finch will be adequately conserved. All Zappapan has proposed is to cut most of the finch monitoring program at Mount Todd, 200 persons person day per year of 360, and give the money saved to the Australian National Parks and Wildlife Service, who are currently assessing the mine proposal for a national recovery program. The Commonwealth Government should be ashamed of entertaining Zappapan's latest proposal. The message it gives the, to the developers who threaten endangered species is they can buy their way out by giving money to the ANPWS. This is particularly disturbing since ANPWS has recently as May 1992 claimed the first step to conserving the bird involves full protection to large breeding colonies. Sacrificing the la largest known colony of finches at Mount Todd is no way to conserve the species." End of quote. Mr Pittick goes on to say, and I quote again, while we welcome ANPWS's establishment of a finch recovery plan, it is only part of a solution that would conserve the finch and allow the mine to proceed. Zappapan's plan offers the finch next to nothing, no reserves for breeding areas and an inadequate monitoring program." End of quote. Further on, in Mr Pittock's attack on this res very respectable company, he says, and again I quote, Zappapan have effectively and deceptively unloaded responsibility protecting the finch. A new monitoring program is proposed that is so weak that timely detection of any significant impact is virtually impossible. While we criticised the previous monitoring proposal, the issue was Zappapan's lack of will to properly implement the CSIRO monitoring plan by collecting sufficient pre-mining data and by defining a significant impact not on the plan itself, which is sound. We note that Zappapan has not repeated many of its unsubstantiated and misleading statements, such as claims in the DEIS that only 1 per cent of the breeding area and 0.2 per cent of the nests of the endangered Gordian finch would be destroyed. While the the vindicates, this vindicates our previous criticism. This is of little comfort is that the Commonwealth Government fails to act in the interests of the finch. And finally, a quote, Zappapan has not answered the serious scientific criticism levelled at the DEIS by the World Wide Fund for Nature, Royal Australasian Orthonologists Union, the Australian Conservation Foundation and the Centre. End of quote. This press release is nothing less than appalling. Zappapan has designed the Mount Todd project to ensure that the Goldian finch population in the Yinberry Hills is protected to the maximum extent practicable. In fact, in a company profile of Zappapan since 1986, 
Approximately $1.5 million has been spent by various organisations on research and investigation into the Goldian Finch. 33 per cent of this has come from Zappapan. I am pleased to note that the Northern Territory Government has been another major contributor with 64 per cent of the $1.5 million going to research on the Finch. The project design features described in the draft Environmental Impact Statement October 1992 represent substantial modifications to initial planning and design concepts with the objective of pre-empting or migrating effects on the Goldian Finch. And they include three points. All but one component have been relocated to alternative sites outside the Inberry Hills. The exception is the main pitch which cannot be relocated. Features that will prevent or discourage access to solutions containing his concentrations of cyanide that could be toxic to wildlife have been incorporated into the design. And specific measures and safeguards will be implemented to enhance and protect the breeding habitat in the Yinberi. In conclusion, the draft environmental impact statement con concludes, and I quote, that mining activity is unlikely to pose long-term threat to the viability of the Goldian finch in the Yinberi Hills. And further on, of, so far, of, so, of far greater concern are factors such as the habitat impact of land use practices across the species range and the prevalence of air sac mines, either or both of which may have contributed to the decline in the, in, in the world of the Goldian finch. I'm afraid the scare campaign undertaken by the Environment Centre NT deserves everything it gets if Zappapan considers taking further action and prosecute the centre for such defamatory statements on this most sensitive issue which Zappapan should be commended on for the way in which they have listened to all concerned interest groups on the mining proposal at Mount Todd in the Northern Territory. Whilst that issue is certainly parochial and a matter of concern to the Northern Territory, uh, it is of opportune and proper to state it. Some of the aspects of this particular bill do appear to be positive and hopefully will be positive with regard to the future of the program. The Coalition will be supporting the bill. Senator Bill. And Deputy President, the Democrats support the thrust of this bill, which is to develop and implement an integrated approach to natural resource management based on ecologically sustainable development. And uh, we, we recognise that the aim of the bill is to facilitate efficient, equitable and sustainable management of Australia's natural resources. And uh, we also recognise that the bill has the support of such groups as Greening Australia, the Australian Conservation Council and the National Farmers Federation. In, uh, in brief, uh, we agree with the description that's been given by Senator Tamling of the uh, purposes of the bill, and uh, <coughs> we, uh, we applaud the fact that it uh, establishes arrangements for the financial assistance between the Commonwealth and the states for, uh, specifically for natural resource management projects. The, uh, the way it goes about this uh, in terms of uh, uh, legislative uh, replacements and uh, uh, making um, the National Water Resources Financial Assistance Act and the Soil Conservation Financial Assist Assistance Act redundant um, is, is, uh, is recognised as well. The, uh, the fact that about 1,400 groups uh, who are at the moment land care groups will be funded through this mechanism uh, provides uh, a, slight, uh, a slightly more efficient and uh, a less circuitous uh, method of funding and that is to be applauded as well. The, um, <coughs> the committee which is to be established through this bill, the National Land Care Advisory Committee, uh, to provide advice on the priorities and strategies for national, natural resource management programs, uh, is something I'll refer to later in terms of the structure of that committee. But the fact that a committee is being established is also uh, recognised as important. And uh, uh, as well as that, to, uh, to have that committee with a uh, non-government uh, majority uh, is, is also important. We uh, uh, think it's, uh, th that the strengths of the bill are that uh, we have an integrated management of land, water and vegetation uh, encouraged and that there is an introduction, and I must say that that is an important word in this uh, context, that it is an introduction of the principles of ecologically sustainable development as a context for the development and implementation of natural resources management in Australia. The, uh, the value of community-oriented approach to natural resources management is uh, recognised by this bill. But uh, we mu I, I must say that uh, 
uh, for all those strengths, uh, it is uh, particularly noticeable that this bill does not provide for a definition of ecologically sustainable development, and that is a significant weakness. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the composition of the National Land Care Advisory Committee is also uh, questioned by us. The, um, we uh, congratulate the government for the reforms it's undertaking in this area of uh, uh, resource management and uh, the integration of the financial arrangements. But we think it's important to uh, uh, support the whole systems approach to national resor natural resources management and uh, that the, uh, the conservation of a biodiversity is a factor which is uh, important to recognise as well. Uh, the, uh, the soil productivity of Australia and the water quality of Australia are matters which have received some considerable press recently and uh, if this is a means by which uh, uh, we can maintain those ecological processes then uh, uh, I hope that it, uh, it has the capacity to deliver uh, and perhaps I'll refer to that a little later. Uh, it is good to see that uh, we have the Minister for the Environment and the Minister for Primary Industries uh, working together, uh, even if only in a tentative manner here, uh, to develop a more integrated approach to natural resources management. Uh, this bill can only be one part of the new approach, but uh, as I said, even if it's tentative, it is to be uh, recognised. Uh, what we, we need and what I understand is being developed is a, a whole new program framework uh, which includes land, water and vegetation and includes the National Land Care Program. The uh, discussion paper, the National Land Care Program, which was uh, produced in uh, April 92, uh, proposed that a single natural resources advisory committee be established to guide the Commonwealth on community attitudes to natural resource issues, issues of national significance and priorities for action. The paper stated that the membership of the committee would comprise parties affected by the outcomes of natural resource management policies and programs. And uh, <coughs> the comments were received uh, on that paper from, uh, amongst other groups, Greening Australia, the Australian Conservation Foundation and the National Farmers Federation. And amongst other things, those groups made three recommendations about the advisory committee. The government has here accepted two of those, that the advisory committee should include a majority of community representatives and that the advisory committee should be chaired by a person from the non-government sector. However, a third point was not accepted, and that was that the community sector be given the right to appoint community positions to the advisory committee. Now I foreshadow a Democrat amendment, which I'll be moving in the committee stages, uh, <coughs> which uh, addresses that problem. The, uh, the reason for it uh, being necessary is that the, uh, it is so important that the, uh, the community itself uh, be recognised for its uh, particular capacity to, uh, to understand what is involved here. And that has been demonstrated, as has been mentioned by Senator Tamley, that has been demonstrated by those uh, hard-working and well-informed and expert uh, practitioners of land care, uh, who are the community, not the bureaucrats, not the academics, and uh, not the, uh, uh, the, the people who are removed from the actual practice of land care. We uh, strongly believe that the community sector should have the right to, to choose who represents them and the community rather than the bureaucracy and the minister are more in touch with those who can best re represent them on uh, such an advisory committee. Uh, the, uh, uh, the expertise, experience and the established networks that we see operating in such groups as Greening Australia should be recognised and should be uh, uh, strongly supported. The, um, uh, the process which we have here, uh, I don't think, uh, uh, pays sufficient regard uh, to those qualities I've just mentioned. The other problem we have uh, with this uh, bill is that it, uh, it lacks uh, the, uh, uh, 
a sufficient definition, or it lacks a definition of ecologically sustainable development, which can be uh, can be followed through. Uh, the um, the problem with this is that we, 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 we end up with a situation where, unless, it is, uh, unless that concept is defined, we have further uh, decisions made and subsequent actions taken, either by the Commonwealth or by state governments, which are able to uh, choose their own definition and are able to provide qualifications to what is ecologically sustainable development. And we had a recent decision by the, Council, the newly formed Council of Australian uh, governments. Uh, the, the decision was to endorse the ESD, without defining it, uh, to endorse the ESD and greenhouse strategies subject to budgetary constraints and priorities. Now, such a qualification uh, by the states and territories, uh, such a qualification uh, makes the whole uh, commitment a non-commitment, an absolute nonsense. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the conduct of the business in the states and territories can be uh, as uh, business as usual. Uh, the, uh, the biophysical constraints of those states uh, uh, have, uh, have been ignored. Uh, they are being exceeded in many, many cases. We can't sustain, we cannot sustain uh, such, a, uh, such a, a, a practice of uh, of conducting our affairs. There will always be economic constraints operating in the economy. That's what it's about. That's what it is. That what it, that's what it means. To use that as a, uh, as a caveat for recognition of ESD is, uh, is so faulty it's ridiculous. Um, and uh, the, uh, the constraints are not temporary. Action to implement the ESD recommendations needs to occur now. Action can't be delayed any longer. And uh, we, uh, we have to demonstrate, we have to demonstrate fully and clearly uh, the, the axiomatic statement, and I'm sure Senator O'Chi would be interested in this, he's terribly interested in axiomatic statements. Well, here's one for him to stick away in his little book, because the governments of Australia don't recognise that unless ecologies are sustained, there cannot be an economy. Now, uh, as I said, I'll foreshadow uh, amendments to be made in the, in the committee stages. Uh, they are amendments which aim to achieve that which I've described. We, they are amendments which do not uh, detract from the thrust of the, uh, of the bill and uh, uh, support rather than uh, mitigate against uh, the minister's reforms in the agricultural sector. Senator Shamarat. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. It's important at the outset to state um, that this bill is integral to the overall approach to facilitating an ecologically sustainable agriculture industry in Australia. The Natural Resources Management Bill, whilst undoubtedly a move in the right direction, has some shortcomings which require attention. The very definition of ecological sustainability is crucial in this regard, as Senator Bell has already mentioned. In the context of an agricultural system, the major determinants for ecological sustainability, according to Dr John Cameron and Jane Elix from the Australian Conservation Foundation, are dependent on the system generating its own nutrients, having a high degree of species diversity, having high comparative energy efficiency, not being dependent on fossil fuel energy sources, not having internal mechanisms for control of pests, having, sorry, internal mechanisms for control of pests and weeds, and being resilient, meaning it can return to its original productivity after a major external shock or a period of stress. Whilst these criteria are not always able to be met, they are nonetheless an ideal that we should work to achieve. Unfortunately, this approach is not accepted in some circles where a more short-term, economically-based approach is favoured. It is this difference in approach to ecologically sustainable development that points to the major shortcomings, shortcoming in the drafting of the legislation we have here. 
The bill states that one of its objects is to facilitate natural resources management in Australia, and I quote, consistent with the principles of ecologically sustainable development. The phrase ecologically sustainable development is, however, not defined in the Act, and this could lead to either misunderstanding or manipulation by vested interests. In most other respects, the Natural Resources Management Bill appears to be a positive step towards better management of our natural resources. In particular, it is pleasing to see at last that a more integrated and holistic approach is being adopted in government policy. We cannot continue to follow the reductionist approach that has dominated government policy making to date, in which the interconnectedness of ecological systems has been neglected or ignored. This approach should be reflected in all government legislation that relates to the environment in which we live, because after all, the environment represents our own life support system. There is, however, a long way to go before we can truly claim to be on the path to sustainability. As Professor William Rees from the University of British Columbia in Canada stated in an article entitled The Ecology of Sustainable Development, most discussion of sustainable development in the socio-political mainstream emphasises the need to sustain economic growth and assumes that we can account for the environment through greater efficiency of resource use, improved technology, better pollution control and wider use of environmental assessment. Such incrementalism may constitute a necessary first step but by itself would result in little more than a somewhat better dressed version of the growth bound status quo, requiring a minimum of adjustment to be a minimum of adjustment be either industry or individuals. The evidence suggests, however, that we may fast be approaching absolute limits to material economic growth. We no longer have the luxury of trading off ecological damage for economic benefits if we hope to have a sustainable future. The maintenance of global ecological integrity necessarily becomes our highest priority and must be taken into account in every local and regional development decision. Finally, from a personal perspective, it was invaluable for me to attend the Winning Back the West conference in Fitzroy Crossing earlier this year. The conference initially examined the history of the pastoral industry in the Kimberleys and the devastating impact that that free-range um, cattle grazing had often had on the ecology of the region. But we were then informed about the many initiatives in the area to minimise the impact of cattle grazing on the rivers and land. In the context of this bill, it is important to note that the role of the local land care groups has been crucial in these developments. It was also interesting to note at this conference that the local Aboriginal population is also contributing to these efforts. And this collaboration is perhaps beginning to assist in developing some common sense of care for the land that we all share. The sentiments expressed by Pat Dodson from the National Reconciliation Council and local Aboriginal representatives during a wonderful meeting on the banks of a dry riverbed on Louisa Downs Station were both inspirational and consistent with this belief. The potential for different groups working together uh, and having Aboriginal representation on the advisory committee is also exciting. As I said at the outset, I believe this bill in establishing the National Land Care Advisory Committee and providing arrangements for financial assistance to the states for natural resource management projects is a step in a positive direction. The Democrats' amendments are further helpful additions because of the spelling out of ecologically sustainable development principles and improving the experienced community representation on the advisory committee. I indicate my support for the Democrat amendments and for this bill. Minister. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, this is an important bill. I thank all of the senators that have contributed uh, to this debate. Land care is something over, over which I must say I have a considerable interest and in my former guise as Minister for Resources uh, provided, I think, some assistance to the land care movements in Australia. But I think at this hour of the day, I won't— Thanks very much, Senator Brownhill. I just want to make sure Hansard's got down your quote to something I did reasonably well. Uh, but, uh, 
Yes, it's, it's indeed. However, I don't wish to labour the point now. I commend the bills to the Senate. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to grant financial assistance in connection with projects relating to natural resources management to establish a natural resource man management fund to establish a national land care advisory committee and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that this, the bill stand is printed. Senator Bell. Mr Chairman, uh, I won't uh, uh, detail. I, I seek leave to move the amendments uh, circulated in the name of the Australian Democrats uh, together. Um, <coughs> is leave granted for the three amendments to be moved together? Leave is granted. Senator Bell. I move all the amendments circulated in the name of the Australian Democrats. Uh, I won't uh, waste the time of the committee by reading uh, the, uh, the details of the amendments. I will uh, uh, describe briefly their purpose. We, um, we have uh, had over some, uh, some considerable time uh, been uh, informed about the government's uh, development and uh, interest in the national strategy for ecologically sustainable development. We have uh, been presented with any number of uh, opinions about this and we have uh, during that process uh, heard a number of people attempting to define ESD. Uh, we, we have uh, received uh, as a result of the considerable amount of time spent on it, the statement of Australia's goal, objectives and guiding principles for the ESD strategy. And um, uh, without uh, listing the, the goal, the core objectives or the guiding principles in, in order, we, we, I'd just like to remind the, uh, the Senate of what the goal uh, has been stated to be, and that is that development that improves the total quality of life, both now and in the future, in a way that maintains the ecological processes on which life depends. And uh, to meet that goal, one of the uh, uh, changes to government institutions and machinery, which has been uh, recognised by this government, has been a commitment, and I read from that commitment quite uh, blatantly in black and white, we, we read the Commonwealth Government will incorporate ESD principles into the objectives of relevant legislation as appropriate, particularly for legislation concerning natural resources use and management. Well, here it is. Natural Resources Management Financial Assistance Bill 1992. The opportunity is there. Uh, so uh, let's see it being incorporated. Uh, the, uh, it is provided by the generosity of the Australian Democrats, remains within the uh, uh, capacity of the government to accept that and to recognise that here is the opportunity to deliver on that promise. Uh, the other part of our amendments is uh, quite simply a matter of recognising the need, as I indicated in my speech, my second reading speech, the need to ensure that the uh, uh, the advisory committee which is to be constituted under this legislation uh, uh, actually takes account of uh, the experience which exists in the community and uh, uh, elects to that committee uh, people with sufficient experience in or knowledge of natural resources management including conservation, vegetation management, environment protection and community organisation. I move the amendments. Senator Tamling. Mr Chairman, at um, 2.20 in the morning we are faced again with further latter-day amendments of the Australian Democrats. My office first saw anything relating to amendments on these bills from the Democrats in a draft form um, 
about midday today. And of course, the uh, final amendment was put on our table, uh, I think, 10 or 15 minutes ago uh, as it was distributed. There are essentially, in the, the package that we're looking at um, from the Democrats, two substantive um, amendments. One which uh, talks about a definitional area in the area of sustainable development, uh, and of course the second uh, relating to the size um, of, of, a, of a, an advisory council or advisory committee. Once again, in uh, the way in which the Democrat policy is developed at the late stages and uh, approaches are made on this, it could only be described uh, as verbal diarrhoea. By the time uh, anyone had uh, finished reading the, the definitions put forward uh, in Clause 4 for the uh, principles of ecologically sustainable developments that the Democrats are proposing, uh, the person would certainly probably have died of old age and nothing would certainly happen to any of the projects. Um, I highlighted in the second reading speech my concern at the process of uh, review that had taken place with regard to Zappapan's development and the frustrations that are being caused there uh, in that particular project. And similarly, I think uh, in reading the principles of ecologically sustainable development that have now been put forward as an amendment to Clause 4, it would give us cause for concern about the viability and the future uh, of any significant and major projects. And uh, of course, I'm sure all senators will take particular interest in the proposals and the policies of the coalition with regard to the fast tracking procedures for appropriate developments in Australia, which create jobs and create wealth and at the same time protect the special environment and Aboriginal interests that have to be preserved in Australia. But uh, what we need to see in legislation is a recognition of those appropriate areas of environmental uh, and Aboriginal interests, as have recently been demonstrated by the Federal Government and the Northern Territory Government in the fast tracking of the Mount Todd proposal in the Northern Territory and also the development of the MacArthur River project uh, by Mount Isa Mines. And, uh, I would certainly commend the work uh, that Mr Brereton uh, and the Northern Territory ministers have invested in ensuring that those projects get up and going. But if we were to accept this type of amendment, uh, we would certainly be bogged and would not be able to get on with that sort of project. With regard to Clause 14 and the Democrat amendment to the National Land Care Advisory Committee, we would not be supporting this amendment, as we believe that a committee of 12 will already have wide representation. It is unnecessary for a committee of 12 um, to be restricted uh, with the, the three, three members, as the Democrats are now proposing, who have experience or in special knowledge of conservation, vegetation management, environment protection and community organisation. Talk about jobs for the boys. Very obviously, the Australian Democrats are looking to uh, <coughs> ensure that they can now stack committees by ensuring that the membership of these committees is both increased and after their particular and special interests. Uh, the, um, the coalition will not be um, supporting these amendments. The Honourable the Minister. Uh, but the uh, Office of the Minister has furnished me with these statements that I can make with respect to the two material uh, amendments before the Chair. And in the case of the first one, let me quote from an authorised uh, comment by the Minister, Mr Crean. We are committed to incorporating into this and other relevant portfolio legislation a more specific reference to the core objectives and agreed principles of ecological sustainable development. As agreed by the governments in the National Strategy for ESD at the recent Council of Australian Governments meeting at the earliest opportunity. And with respect to the second amendment, the government of course again does not support these proposed changes. But I can say that the legislation reflects the government's balanced approach and therefore no particular interests will be given prominence in the membership of the National Land Care Advisory Committee. As the Minister stated, that's Minister Crean in the second reading speech, the non-government representatives, including the Chair, will form the majority of the committee's membership. These will be well-qualified individuals from a broad range of backgrounds. With those comments, Mr uh, Chairman, on the record, I indicate the government's opposition to these amendments. Senator Shamaroo. 
Um, as I indicated earlier, Mr Chairman, I will be supporting the Democrats' amendments if they choose to call a division on it. And I must say that the comments I've just heard from the opposition and the government um, cause me some genuine alarm because I would have thought that the Democrats' amendments were eminently sensible for this bill, for inclusion in this bill. I believe, in fact, it is shoddy and slapdash to leave out such important concepts as definitions of the ESD process and also to specify that within a committee who's addressing this, um, these concepts, there should be some relevant experience. I think I was not necessarily expecting the opposition to support the amendments, um, but I feel that refusal um, to accept the very, very reasonable amendments put forward by the Democrats actually calls into question the genuine motivation of both the government and the opposition in regard to this bill. It almost makes me feel like voting against the bill, which would, I realise, be a token uh, gesture. And um, I will maintain my support of it, but I, I do um, criticise strongly the government for failing to include these components within the legislation. Senator Bell. Uh, Mr Chairman, um, I, must, uh, uh, I uh, welcome the uh, statement uh, by the Minister for Prime Industries that has been given to us by the Minister representing. Uh, I must. Uh, address the typical criticism that has been delivered by Senator Tambling. Um, the, uh, the, the normal response we, we have uh, received for anything which has not given um, several weeks' worth of consideration has been that it is all a bit fast for the, uh, for the, uh, the thinkers opposite. Uh, I must say that uh, the uh, the, the principles of ecologically sustainable development, which we have listed here, are um, in concert with the principles contained in the Brimpland report. And uh, Senator Tambling should have, if he was interested in these sorts of things, had that uh, particular document on his bookshelf for at least three years. Uh, if uh, these principles are a revelation to him today, then I'm only sorry that. Uh, uh, he has revealed that by showing that he, he, do, he hasn't had the time to uh, appreciate and understand them. I would have thought that uh, <coughs> there was plenty of notice uh, for those who are interested in these principles to have absorbed and uh, uh, reached a conclusion about their appropriateness uh, to be included in legislation. Uh, I <coughs> was uh, about ready to uh, accept the uh, uh, the reasons for not uh, uh, going along with the second phase of our <laughs> amendments, uh, that which uh, considered the numbers on the committee, uh, I thought that, uh, well, that's fair enough. Uh, there, there's a reason for that. The sting in the tail of uh, Senator Tamling's reasons I thought was gratuitous and uh, uh, really not worthy of this place. So I was happy to accept the reasons, but uh, I thought the insult was, uh, was useless. Uh, the, uh, again, I welcome the statement by the Minister. Senator Calder. Mr Chairman, <clears throat> very briefly, uh, one is never surprised when the uh, opposition gets up and speaks on things like ESD when they reveal that they have very little knowledge or care less about uh, things environmental. Uh, as my colleague Senator Bell has pointed out, at least as long as Brundtland, the concepts of ESD have been uh, well rehearsed. Um, <clears throat> the government itself, after much prodding, set up nine committees which looked at ESD, made many hundred recommendations in relation to ESD. That was some 13 months ago. The government is yet to take up any of those, any of those recommendations, so the government has not shown uh, any great uh, willingness to process this. And for the minister now to turn around and say that they will insert these principles at the earliest opportunity, well, here is the first and earliest opportunity, yet they're not prepared to do it. And I find it quite remarkable, and I think it, it indicates that still, at this stage, neither the government nor the opposition have either any understanding nor any commitment serious commitment to ESD. 
They're really playing with it. They have taken up the, uh, the words, and we've seen just today Mr Fisher release for the opposition their concept of ESD. They're going to set up a department, and uh, it, it is exactly what uh, Senator Tambling has said. It is a department of fast-track development. The, the idea of ecological has been dropped entirely from the, from the concept. It's sustainable development. Well, they don't yet know that development is not going to be sustainable if they don't look after the environment. That's, there's still a shock in, in store for them. Many of us have already understood that. We're trying to teach that lesson to, uh, to a few others. They're still to learn it, very unfortunately, and very unfortunately for this country. And uh, I think if Senator Tambling were to go back and review the history of, um, of uh, EISs, for instance, he would find that those EISs that have been most thoroughly carried out, those EISs where the public have been most thoroughly involved and the longest time has been involved, that those, those uh, projects that then as a, as a, uh, the, uh, uh, that uh, eventuate at the end of that process, those projects have done the least environmental damage, have gone forward to the greatest profitability and have been the most successful projects. And fast tracking really is, is a, uh, is a uh, a, um, uh, a recipe for, for uh, imminent disaster. And uh, if the opposition are going to fast track everything, they're really going to uh, rip this country apart. And uh, that's a lesson that is already there in the record if they choose to look at it, but there, it's, a, it's a lesson that they're not choosing to, uh, to, to learn, or a lesson even that they're choosing to look at at this time. So, uh, we will divide on this, Mr Chairman. It is a very important principle. It is the first opportunity that the government has to incorporate this into uh, legislation. It's choosing not to, and that is a very sad reflection, but it's a, not an unsurprising reflection. And again, let me say that on Monday, when the Prime Minister releases his environment statement, I'll be very surprised if there's any strong emphasis on ESD. If there is, I will be there pointing out to the Prime Minister how hollow uh, his words are. The question is the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required? Division is required. Ring the bells. Hmm? What did you say, aye?
Dr. Dawes, the question is that the amendments moved. Order. Order. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator Bell be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, <coughs> the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Bourne teller for the ayes, Senator Brown teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division being ayes 9, noes 51, the question is resolved in the negative. Would honourable senators please resume their seats or leave the chamber? Uh, Honourable Senators who are standing, please resume their seats or leave the chamber. Those who are half standing might do the same. Order. The question is that the bill stand is printed. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill would be reported. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Just in case I got my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Chairman of Committees, Senator Colston, uh, reports that the Committee has considered the National Resources Management Financial Assistance Bill 1992 and agreed to it without amendments. I move the report of the committee be adopted. 
question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister? I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark? A bill for an act to grant financial assistance in connection with projects relating to natural resources management, to establish a natural resources management fund, to establish a national land care advisory committee, and for related purposes. Order. Um, messages, messages have been received from the House of Representatives returning the Migration, Offences and Undesirable Persons Amendment Bill 1992 and the International Labor Organisation Compliance with Conventions Bill 1992 and acquainting the Senate that the House of Representatives has agreed to the bills without amendment. Clark. Business order of the day number six, National Residue Survey Administration Bill 1992 and associated bills. Second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Tambry. Mr Deputy President, the National Residue Survey Administration Bill and Cognate Bills are to allow the government to recover 100 per cent of the government's cost of undertaking the National Residue Survey from July next year instead of the current 60 per cent. This survey conducted by the government to determine the chemical status of Australian food. Until a few years ago, the government paid the $6 million annual cost as a public health measure. This changed to 50-50 and then 40-60, and now complete cost recovery is required, all of it from primary industry. My colleague, the member for Murray and Shadow Minister for Primary Industry, Bruce Lloyd, pointed out in his second reading speech in the House of Representatives that he was unaware of any other country in the world where producers are required to pay in full, as this bill requires, for a public health facility. In the industry, there are 25 separate items on the schedule, encompassing 17 levy bills. This shows the spread of levy throughout agriculture. The survey analyses samples Australian produced animal and plant food product, particularly meat, for residues of a wide range of contaminants. Those who are in the agricultural industry are generally fed up with this Labor government because of the number of charges that have been imposed on the industry. On one hand, the industry is being pushed to promote the pure food status of Australian food products, which is worth promoting. When it comes to any form of government assistance to the industry, another tax is slapped on them. The government could not even assist the industry to the tune of half of the $6 million per annum required for the public health facility. Half of $6 million, that is a mere $3 million a year. These bills are to allow the government to recover 100 per cent of the government's cost of undertaking Order, the National a Residue bit more, Survey. A little bit more shush <coughs> on the left-hand side of the chamber, please. Mr Sorry, Deputy Senator President, Pete, as I said, these bills are to allow the government to recover 100 per cent of the government's cost of undertaking the National Residue Survey from July next year, instead of the current 60 per cent. The Cattle Council, which represents the major levy payers, has objected to this increase because it believes that while it does benefit from survey in the marketplace, the major reason for the survey is public health. Other levy payers have also objected, and to the rural industry this bill is seen as being symbolic of the Labor government's attitude of unfairly transferring public costs to farmers, imposing user pays with no accountability as to efficiency of the program. The National Residue Survey Administration Bill 1992 provided for a trust account to be established which will allow funds and obligations to be carried over beyond the end of the financial year. Provision is also made for other contributions to be received from industries. This will give industry more flexibility in the way their costs are paid if they don't want a levy. Industries will have the power to pull out of the survey or, alternatively, have more products included. The minister cannot include products unless satisfied that the industry wants them included. By increasing its cost recovery from 60 to 100 per cent, the Commonwealth expects to save about $2.7 million. As these are budget bills, the coalition parties will not be opposing them. However, as uh, Mr Lloyd has already alluded to in his second reading speech, the coalition on elected to government will amend this legislation and return to 50 per cent cost recovery. The coalition believes that 
that, that is a reasonable apportionment of the public health situation versus the industry. We would, of course, make the appropriate uh, budget adjustments that would be necessary to implement any such uh, amendment and change in the future. There are 18 of these primary industry bills in total, and I would hope that it is possible to consolidate some of them in the future. This will be an issue during the election campaign. The opposition will be saying to industry that it recognises that government has a responsibility, as well as industry, and that when it comes to encouragement for promotion overseas, as well as reassurance at home of the pure food status of our products, a coalition government is prepared to give some practical and pragmatic recognition and assistance. That will certainly be on the agenda for the forthcoming election. Senator Bell. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, the Democrats support this bill to the extent that it sets up a trust account from which to pay the costs of the National Residue Survey. The Democrats wholeheartedly support the Residue Survey run by the Bureau of Resource Sciences, Sciences but we agree with many of the criticisms that have been made of that survey. Many argue that export product, produce is uh, still predominant in the survey at the exclusion of domestic produce, particularly fruit and vegetables, although agricultural chemicals are widely used in their production. The Australian Science and Technology Council, for example, has said that the survey should be expanded, and I quote, to provide a broad-based monitoring program for all agricultural produce. <coughs> Some argue that the range of chemicals tested is too narrow. The Science and Technology Council says, and I quote, that the areas of deficiency are in analyses for antibiotics, anthelmintics and hormones in meat, and for fruit and vegetable and minor crops in general, grains and imported food. Another concern is the adequacy of procedures to enable the identification of the source of excessive chemical residues. The National Farmers Federation stated to the Senate Committee on Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals that, and I quote, the effectiveness of the NRS as a monitor and a means, for, uh, and a, and a means of preventing excessive residues is dependent on, on the ability to trace the products tested back to their source. NFF argues, <coughs> I'm sorry, NFF urges the introduction of procedures which will permit residues detected in NRS to be traced back to source and for the NRS to be directed more more towards locating residue levels in excess of MRLs." End of quote from the NFF. Another criticism was that the survey didn't include imported food, but a recent bill has corrected this. All of these concerns have been accepted by the Senate Select Committee on Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals. The other criticism, and one shared by the Democrats, concerns funding arrangements. <coughs> A widely shared view is that the survey should be funded by a levy on chemical sales instead of a levy on, on uh, uh, food producers. Both the Australian Science and Technology Council and the Senate Committee have suggested a monitoring levy on the chemical industry itself, the chemical producing industry that is. Uh, it goes without saying, I think, uh, from uh, the um, consistent stance that uh, we have taken uh, in this area, that the Democrats would much prefer that we don't need to monitor our produce for chemical residues at all, because uh, uh, we should reach the situation where no harmful chemicals are being used in their production. We, uh, to be practical, though, we recognise that although we don't stand alone with this view, it is widely believed that we must throw chemicals around all over the place in order to maintain our agricultural and horticultural industries. Using chemicals in agriculture has become a billion dollar industry with the inbuilt incentives. Uh, the uh, the uh, inbuilt incentives uh, maintain vested interests and ensure that there is a continued uh, uh, drive towards expansion of this industry. This bill itself will do nothing to, uh, to contain that expansion. It will fund the survey. And it's flexible enough to expand as the need to monitor, chemi monitor chemicals in our food expands. That won't attack the fundamental problem, which is the attitude which encourages our growing dependence on chemicals. The uh, proposals here place a levy on producers, whether they use chemicals or not. 
If we're to have the uh, principles of cost recovery and user pays, we should do it properly. The funds for this survey should come from the sale of chemicals. That then becomes an economic incentive to limit their use. <clears throat> and that's our fundamental objection to the bill, not just the principle of cost recovery. Uh, I foreshadow uh, that I'll be moving a, an amendment at the committee stage, which, if passed, uh, would enable the minister to come back next year with a proposal that rightly places the cost burden on the chemical industry itself. I'd also foreshadow that that amendment will uh, have the effect of inviting the coalition to, um, to actually vote for the, uh, uh, the policy enunciated by Senator Tamley. And I'd suggest that in this case the excuse that he's not seen it before uh, cannot be applied is in fact the policy of the coalition. And uh, the, uh, uh, the mention in uh, uh, the Shadow Minister's second reading speech uh, in uh, the other place that no other country in the world, uh, to his knowledge, uh, exists where producers are required to pay 100 per cent of the costs of such a survey is a, a comment which I would endorse and uh, a comment which uh, I, would, I would agree is uh, a, a situation which, uh, uh, which should be recognised by those who propose that our producers meet the 100 per cent cost. I would also agree with uh, much of uh, the rest of what was contained in Senator Tamling's speech about the, uh, uh, the necessity to recognise that uh, such uh, costs placed on our producers um, are not equitable, uh, that they don't recognise that there is a community health benefit from, uh, uh, from surveying and understanding what is in our foods, and uh, that, uh, in fact, um, the government has an obligation to reduce the amount of uh, tax imposition on our, on our producers, on our primary producers. Now, I would recognise those things, and because I recognise them, uh, I foreshadow that I'll be moving an amendment to, uh, to meet the concerns expressed on behalf of the coalition. Uh, <clears throat> we do not share the view that because it's a budget bill it is sacrosanct and cannot be touched. There certainly can be a request made. And, uh, uh, perhaps uh, it should be realised that uh, that um, particular uh, excuse has on occasions been ignored by the coalition uh, when it suits them. So uh, with those comments I will uh, uh, eagerly await the, the uh, committee stages. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, there are a couple of points I will be very brief about. I thank all the senators for their responses. Uh, one point was about which other countries might be uh, on full cost recovery. My advice is that uh, New Zealand and the United Kingdom both have full cost recovery in place of their national residue monitoring programs, and that the move to full cost recovery for the National Residue Survey is consistent with the current, policy, current government policy on user pays in Australia. It is, uh, in that respect, part of the overall microeconomic reform package. On the point that Senator Bell was making, um, that the chemical industry has not been asked to contribute to the cost of the National Residue Survey, well, that's because it, uh, it already contributes substantially to the cost of establishing residue limits, and the occurrence of residues above those limits is, of course, frequently due to misuse of chemicals. The, the other reason is that large parts of the survey are for residual, residual chemicals no longer produced uh, by that industry or from natural resources. I think the other comment I should make is about the uh, survey itself, uh, which is about uh, uh, adding value to Australian produce not covered by other surveys. It's, it's a trade-based survey. It's not about nutritional habits. And uh, The Australian market, uh, market Basket Survey, which is conducted by the National Food, Food Authority, is to estimate the di dietary intakes of chemical contaminants by Australians. That uh, survey is based on a small sample size of processed and raw food uh, available in supermarkets. The food is uh, prepared to table ready for form before analysis and foods included in that survey are not necessarily of Australian origin. Mr Acting Deputy President, with those comments which relate to some of the uh, points raised by the speakers in this debate, I commend these bills to the Parliament. The question is that the bills be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. National Residue Survey Administration Bill 1992 and 18 related levy bills.
Bill first as a demo at a minute. Um, is it the wish of the committee that... Well, we'll, just, say we did well, we'll just deal with the um, National Residue, National Residue, Residue Survey, Survey Administration first. Act. Administration Act. Um, Senator Bell's got a, an amendment, I think. Is the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? Been no objections, so ordered. Question is, this bill stand as printed? Senator Archer. Senator Archer. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. I wish to <coughs> get some information concerning the, the uh, schedule of the bill. Uh, table table uh, under section four. Um, and to get some information on how these um, suggested operative rates have been put together. And I, uh, I particularly look at uh, potatoes, where according to information that I've received from the, uh, from the department, it says that uh, potato rate was calculated allowing a potato program costing $52,000 and domestic production level for 1991 of 1,180,000 tonnes. Now, on a, on a cost of that nature, I then find it completely incongruous to have probably the most similar vegetable you could, and that's an onion, listed as showing at a dollar fifty-six a ton. Now, if, the, um, if that figure is not a misplaced decimal point and a few other things as well, which I would obviously trust that it is, um, I would just like the department of uh, the minister to, uh, to bear in mind that at a dollar fifty six a ton that's probably all the profit there is in exporting onions if uh, and there's just no way in the world that you can have an industry that is being run just to fund a, a residue survey um, when uh, honey is point one two cents a kilo uh, and onions a dollar fifty six a ton or potatoes 4.5 cents a ton, uh, there's, there's clearly a mistake of some sort. But in so doing, um, because I sensed that this was the case a week or so ago, I at least contacted the Minister's office and I received a response which is one page in extent and which I seek leave to include in the, in the Hansard for record purposes. Please provides that information. Leave is granted. Senator Archie. Um, yes, I'd just like some information on that uh, at the moment because, uh, say, clearly, if, if that figure in the, uh, in the table is, is as the minister believes it should be, well, then we should certainly be moving an amendment um, to have it changed because it's ridiculous. If it is wrong, let's put it right now, because whichever way it is, at a dollar fifty-six a ton, it cannot stand. Minister, I think, Mr. Uh, Chairman, the figure is the accurate figure. I have to say, the uh, method of calculation for it is the same as the method method of calculation for the other figures in the schedule, and uh, that is that there has been uh, an estimate of the project projected costs of the survey, and uh, that is. Uh, and the, uh, that, that is one element of the calculation. The other element of the calculation is the production uh, of the particular commodity. And uh, the objective of the, uh, of the calculation of the formula is to make sure there's no cross-subsidising between the various categories of commodity that are mentioned here, so that you've got a fair uh, cost per commodity and not any cross-subsidising. So uh, I understand the point that Senator Archer is making. But uh, I have to say that uh, my advice is that uh, when you calculate it in that way, which I think people would regard as a fair way, 
the results come out as you see uh, displayed in the schedule. Senator Raj. Minister, we're talking 75,000 tonnes of one product against 1,180,000 tonnes of another product. Now, all we're looking for is, is, a, is a, um, a residue in, the, uh, in these. Is it necessary to test every onion against, against checking, say, one potato per 100 tonnes? Because, you know, we, the, the figures are just ridiculous. And um, the, the testing, I understand, is, is no different. It can be done in the same laboratory with the same plant to come up with the result. You know, potatoes are grown in every state in Australia. Onions are grown in every state in Australia. The, um, uh, the, the, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't stand up. And be before we can possibly agree to wreck an industry because of, uh, of some crazy costing figure, we just need to know what is the, is the similarity or the difference that the de departmental officers see is necessary between these two products and, and why this should be. Minister. <coughs> Perhaps I should have said that the, uh, we're, we're not talking here about all the onions produced. We're, we're, talking, we're talking about the export production of onions. And uh, the. Uh, well, I, I'm advised that. Uh, I'm, right. I'm advised that that is the correct uh, situation, Senator. The, um, and we, when we're talking about the way in which the survey is to be conducted, we're not applying a different type of sampling to one commodity as opposed to the other. The, the, uh, the approach here is by random sampling with uh, the necessary weighting to make sure there is a fair, uh, a fair sample uh, compared to the volume of production. So uh, uh, it's not that someone's picking on the humble onion. It's that uh, when you apply those uh, measures, it comes out this way. Yes, but, right. but Minister, you're still not on, on track. It doesn't matter whether it's one ton of onions or a million tons of onions. We're talking about a dollar fifty-six per ton of what is exported, as against four point five cents per ton of the potatoes that are exported. Now, do you understand that? It's, a, it's nearly 40 times the rate for onions it is for potatoes. Uh, and I think that anyone here, even at this hour of the day, would be able to see that that is ridiculous. You know, please, is it, is it a decimal point that's gone wrong or something? Because it, it just is obviously stupid. Well. Senator, uh, I do understand your point, and uh, surely you may, by, by in return, understand the explanation. Uh, this is this is not a mistake in the schedule. No, I have, I have given you an explanation with the greatest of respect. The, uh, the advice I have given the Senate is that the method of calculating these figures is by uh, projecting the costs of the survey Good. and looking at the exportable uh, tonnage, in this case of onions, and coming to a figure. Now, no one is saying that the way in which you um, sample onions is different from how you might sample potatoes or some other commodity. I have, uh, I have a further breakdown of the estimates. It, it, uh, the explanation I've given you is consistent with the figures that I'll now put on the record. For example, for, for uh, uh, onions, the proposed total cost for the survey is, in dollar terms, $85,300. And the production against which this is calculated for 1990-1991 in tonnes 
export only is 54,578. That comes to a unit cost uh, per tonne of uh, 156 cents. For potatoes, the proposed total cost of the survey is $52,500 $52, and the production in tonnes for 1990-1991 is 1, 180000 which brings a unit cost per tonne of 4.5 cents. So, uh, no, the, the, so it is clear it is clear how the figures come out. For, for potatoes, the total cost is 52,500 for the survey. For onions, it's 85,300. The production of uh, onions was 54,500. For potatoes, it's 1,180,000. And, and if you apply that, th those inputs, you get these outputs on that, uh, on that cost ratio. Sell one million one hundred and eighty thousand tons of potatoes overseas. Why do you select? Why do you select one as being the export of onions only, and one the the domestic consumption of potatoes on the other? Let's put it to. Let's look at the two things together. And why do you need to? Alternatively, why do you need to inspect? and test 35 times as many onions out of the crop as you do potatoes. Now this is the this is the sort of silly answer that we've got. It is just absolute nonsense. It's not even Irish logic even this time. No, Minister. Mr Chairman, the uh, onions are for the purposes of this levy costed only insofar as the export of onions is concerned, not the domestic consumption of onions. <coughs> but potatoes are for the total production. Right. And the explanation that I'm advised is that it is not possible to calculate the uh, right, is it that not possible to calculate the production? <laughs> it is not possible to let well, no, I, I'm just wanting to pause so that I'm precise because I, 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 I want to be precise because I uh, divine there's a bit of uh, temperature rising in the chamber and I think that, no, 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 I, I don't need half an hour adjournment. I want to just check each of my word with the advisers so the record is, is correct. The advice I have is that it is not possible to levy domestic onions. Because there, well, the advice is there is no existing mechanism in place to do it. Uh, yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, my further advice is that onions are export sensitive. It is not the domestic end of the onion market that needs the survey, it is the export end. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I, or something no, no, we can't. We must deal with the legislation now. I've provided the Senate with an explanation. No, with the explanation. With respect. Well, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, if, if that's the best, uh, should we move an amendment? Because it is ridiculous to pass something which could absolutely wreck an industry. It's ridiculous. A dollar fifty-six a ton is more than every onion exporter in Tasmania made for the whole of last year's export crop. They didn't make a dollar fifty-six a ton. Now we're going to lumber them with something that's going to ensure that there is no export industry, or are we going to get this costing down to something like what is reasonable for others? We're talking 25 cents a ton for apples and pears or citrus fruits. We're talking 4.5 cents, as, as you know, for, for potatoes. 
This sort of thing. Why a dollar fifty-six per ton for onions? The thing is nonsense. And I don't want to be a party to trying to wreck the industry because of some stupidity that is perpetrated here in this act. And uh, it, it's just not good enough. And uh, to say that one thing needs to be done because it's export and the other one needs to be done because it's domestic, well, you know, let's be consistent about it and say, well, does it matter whether it's done for export? Does it matter whether it's done domestically? But just let's be consistent and let's come up with something that's reasonable. But at $1.56 a tonne, you could do damn near every onion. You know, it, it's, it's just crazy. At best, you only need a, probably an onion tested for every, every export truckload, that, you know, every 20 tonne container or something, at, at the best. I have grown onions for export. And I, I do know the, uh, you know, if you've got a, 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 an, a, an onion crop of 50 acres, say, you don't need to test every onion if you've treated them all the same way. If you're growing them in a district and they're all treated through the same, um, the, the same plan, you don't need to test every onion. Now I know that onions are grown for export in Western Australia, South Australia, New South Wales and uh, Victoria, Tasmania and Queensland. But they're all grown on much the same basis and we're wind up, winding up now with a, with a nonsense. And I'm not for giving up until I've, uh, I'm prepared to uh, let uh, Senator Bell now have a, have a bit of a, a chase of the rabbit, but I'll, uh, I, I want to come back to it before we finish. Uh, Senator Tambry. Mr um, Chairman, can I um, propose to the minister that uh, it is very obvious in, in light of the issue that Senator Archer has raised uh, and has identified, that uh, it would be very desirable to make an amendment. Uh, now, whether that amendment could be either to delete the reference and the line to onions completely from the schedule, um, and, uh, or alternatively, um, it would be um, probably appropriate that I, I could um, move an amendment uh, to be made to the schedule to, um, to change the item appearing against onions, that is the $1.56 uh, and, the, and the $5 items, and substitute them with um, a more appropriate figure that would be consistent um, with the, the, the rules of mathematics that have been applied across the rest of uh, of the proposal, so I invite the minister to respond, and uh, I, I believe that uh, Senator Archer um, would probably also be attracted to either one of those types of amendments, either dropping, dropping the onions or amending the onions. Right, um, Minister, do you wish to respond? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think, you know, understandably, at this hour, uh, there's a bit of uh, confusion in the chamber. And uh, there seems to be a bit of uh, heat being generated for the concern of what appears to be a problem. Uh, well, with the greatest of respect, Senator, I think you have had your questions answered in full. Uh, uh, I am advised that this Act contains a provision that uh, these uh, uh, levy rates will, in the end, be fixed by, uh, by regulation, can be fixed by regulation. And of course, those regulations would come and lay on the table in this chamber for allowance or otherwise. Yeah. I also am advised, Mr. Uh, Chairman, that uh, it is the intention of the uh, of the minister that there be consultation. Uh, the uh, note I have here is that the National Residue Survey bills do not actually set any level of cost recovery, except implied by the operative rates in the schedule, which will be reviewed and reset by regulation after consultation with the industry. So the figures we're talking about 
are uh, the implied operative rates set out in the schedule. And those rates will be reviewed and they'll be reset by regulation after the industry has been uh, consulted at length. The bills, the bills, however, provide mechanisms for more equitable means of cost recovery to replace the current arrangements and for better and more accountable management through the establishment of a trust account, irrespective of the level of recovery uh, or which industries participate. So uh, the, the advice I have is that the, in, the intention is further consultation with industry to settle these figures, and then they, the actual figures will be made by regulation, and there will be a chance then for them to be disallowed, if that's, uh, if that's what the will of the parliament is, but they'll lay on the table in the normal way of all regulations. Senator Archer. Minister, in, in view of the fact that it's that time of the year and in the genuine spirit of goodwill with which we we try and achieve these matters, I am prepared to, uh, to settle for the undertaking that you've provided, that there, that there be consultation with the industry um, and that the, the matter be thoroughly determined before we have uh, the imposition of a, uh, uh, of a charge of this nature and that, uh, that the arrangements as far as inspection goes should be in keeping with what is a reasonable charge for a reasonable job. Senator Bell. I was merely uh, going to uh, suggest that uh, it seemed to me that uh, part of the, the real problem, the key to, uh, to what's being discussed here, is the original estimate of the cost of the survey, which uh, I would ask that the minister uh, uh, pay particular attention to uh, when that uh, consultation is taking place. Well, of course I will. I just want to get it on the record quite clearly, Senator Archer, that you have uh, reframed back to me the proposition in terms that the Christmas spirit uh, settles on you about. And uh, as you were, I was seeking advice that I, whether or not I can confirm those terms from my advisers in the box. They advise me I can, and because of that advice, I do. The question is then that the bill stand. Oh, sorry, Senator Bill. <laughs> I'm sorry too, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman. Uh, I uh, move the, uh, uh, the amendments cir circulated in the name of the Australian Democrats. Uh, I don't believe I need to, uh, to attach any particular ceremony to this amendment. I've rehearsed it uh, in my second reading speech. Uh, it uh, simply proposes to, uh, uh, to reduce the uh, <coughs> the, uh, the rates that are described on pages six and seven in the tables that are there uh, to the uh, uh <coughs> reduce them by uh, by uh, fifty percent to enable uh, the uh, the producers of the uh, of the food items so listed uh, to uh, uh, to contribute a more uh, uh, more equitable amount. <coughs> Uh, Senator Tambley. Mr Chairman, I rise to speak on this amendment at 3.20am. Mm -hmm. I think it is ironic that the, the other two previous amendments that the Democrats have moved this morning have been considered at 1.20am and at 2.20am and now this one at 3.20am, which certainly highlights the ridiculous situation of the legislative program uh, and also the fact that primary industry legislation of course, is always at the tail end of any parliamentary consideration, uh, whether it is in appropriations or in the legislative program. Mm -hmm. And it is concerning that we do have to address yeah. amendments. I will acknowledge that Senator Bell did provide me mm -hmm. with a copy of this amendment, uh, I think, earlier in the week, um, with, with a view to enabling it to be considered. But uh, I do have to challenge Senator Bell and the Democrats uh, on the issue that. Um, what they are seeking to do, of course, is uh, in general, in, 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 in the general thrust of the policies that the coalition have announced that they would pursue. However, the Democrats haven't indicated how they would fund the trust fund shortfall of money to enable the survey to continue uh, or to, to be undertaken. So this amendment uh, would uh, achieve little other than to make the same task unworkable. And uh, 
I would uh, certainly indicate that, uh, you know, in view of the, the nature of the legislation, it would have no effect uh, on, on this legislation to come into effect before the next federal election because of the consideration of it. And considering that the legislation would not take effect until July of next year, and between then uh, and now, there will be a federal election. The coalition will therefore make the necessary changes, as we've already announced our policies in this area, to provide for 50 per cent of the survey and provide the appropriate funding to ensure that it can continue. Therefore, the coalition will not waste any more of the Senate's time. Uh, Minister? But, uh, if uh, this, this amendment were to succeed, the whole thing will have to go back to the House and come up, and it's just not practical at this hour. Well, the question is, the amendment moved by Senator Bell be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. On the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The question is now that the bill stand is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Hence say no. I think the ayes have it. Take all the is it the wish of the committee that the bill, uh, that the committee, the uh, what? remaining bills? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's the wish of the committee that the remaining bills be taken as a whole. There being no objection, so ordered. The question is that the remaining bills stand as printed. Those that have been say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that all the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think at 3.25 the ayes have it. <coughs> you have to read them all out too. Right? The temporary chairman of the committee, Senator Calvert, reports that the committee has considered the National Residue Survey Administration Bill and 18 related bills and agreed to them without amendments. The Honourable Minister. The report of the committee be adopted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister? Bills be read a third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The National Residue Survey Administration Bill 1992 and 18 related levy bills. Government Business Order of the Day number 7, Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals Administration Bill 1992, Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals Amendment Bill 1992, second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Tamley. Mr Deputy President, the Agricultural and Veterinary Chemical Administration Bill 1992 and the Agricultural and Veterinary Chemical Amendment Bill 1992 established the National Registration Authority for Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals. It will replace the existing eight separate state and territory registration bodies and is another step towards the national registration of these chemicals. Preparation for this legislation commenced in 1967. In July 1991, the Commonwealth state and territory governments agreed to replace the existing eight state and territory registration bodies with a single national scheme to register agricultural and veterinary chemicals. These bills establish the National Registration Authority for Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals and is another step to the development of a national registration scheme. The authority will replace the Australian Agricultural and Veterinary Chemical Council as well as eight state and territory statutory authorities. Its statutory power is considered necessary as it will be the national registration authority for these chemicals. The bills do not change the arrangement for the registration of agricultural and veterinary chemicals Another bill to do, so, to do that is expected next year. The minister will have the power to direct the authority in exceptional circumstance, but he does, if, if he does, he must present the direction to both houses of parliament and it has to be reported in the authority's annual report. The authority will have eight part-time directors appointed by the minister for three years. They will come from industry, state government, the rural sector, the trade union movement and consumer organisations. The authority must fully recover its cover from the agent, <coughs> the, the AgVet chemical industry, over the next four years. To give the authority maximum flexibility to operate in a businesslike manner, free of government and public service restraints, it can set the terms and conditions of employment for its staff. It is being established before the main legislation relating to the National Registration Scheme to allow it contribute to the development of the legislation it will administer and to consult with interested groups. 
The Australian agricultural industry is one of the least intensive uses of agricultural and veterinary chemicals of any country in the world. Australian agriculture has also been one of the most careful users of agricultural and veterinary chemicals. That is a positive image and situation that we should continue to exploit with our exports to other countries. Australian agriculture is not a heavy user of chemicals compared with many other countries due to the fact that our agriculture is extensive rather than intensive. This means that it has a low input cost system because it only gets a low return in export markets. Much of our agricultural area has low rainfall and this creates certain restraints on the use of agricultural and veterinary chemicals from a cost effectiveness point of view. Also, much of our agriculture is grazing, livestock production <coughs> rather than cropping. Cropping forms of agriculture are heavier users of agriculture and veterinary chemicals than the grazing industry. At present, we have the situation in the sheep industry where the industry would be better off if it could afford to use more veterinary chemicals than is, the, than is the present, presently the case, a situation brought about by the low returns to many of those sheep farmers. On the other hand, horticulture is a more intensive user, but it has adopted a positive policy to reduce the use of agricultural chemicals. I have noted the comments made by my colleague, Member for Murray, and the Shadow Minister for Primary Industry, Mr Bruce Lloyd, regarding the horticultural industry's policy towards reducing the use of agricultural chemicals to biological control. The growers have a legitimate complaint because while in Australia there are restrictions on the use of chemicals and on residue with regard to fruit, vegetables, meat, etc., at this stage there are not the same requirements on the products coming into Australia with which they have to compete. That is an unfair situation as well as one that is not in the best interests of the consumer. I know that progress is being made in this area. I just hope that it accelerates so that we have a situation where the standards required for people producing food in Australia are applied equally to that food, or whatever it may be, which is being imported. These bills are, <coughs> are supported by the industry and they are also supported by the coalition. Senator Bell. Deputy President, <clears throat> the Australian Democrats support the general direction of these bills, but they fall far short of what is required. Senators may recall some of the uh, issues I've raised on the adjournment, in particular relating to the use of chemicals in the environment. I've spoken of the poisoning of fish in the Barwon River near the border between Queensland and New South Wales, caused by runoff from a nearby cotton farm. Samples taken from the area were positive for endosulfan an insecticide withdrawn from the home garden, home garden market in March this year. I've spoken by the problems caused by aerial spraying in Tasmania, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, and given the story about the results from spraying insecticides at a Hobart kindergarten for children having a variety of physical disabilities. As a result of uh, the uh, problems associated with that, the schools eventually closed. It is a fact that the issue of the use of chemicals in our, our environment and their effect on people's health uh, is a subject with which almost everyone has some first-hand knowledge. There are groups of concerned people all over the country and they are trying to bring some sanity and control into our propensity, propensity to throw chemicals around. I quote from a letter from uh, Mr Peter Harding, President of the Australian Chemical mm -hmm. Trauma Alliance, and he writes to me saying, I am writing to you to bring to your attention the number of our members who have been injured and made ill through exposure to toxic chemicals, many of them having been affected by pesticides and herbicides, uh, which have been their downfall. It is bad enough that disabling illnesses frequently result from exposure to various toxins, but this is usually followed by hardship and upheaval, which are indescribable to those who have not been similarly affected. This stems from the fact that either insufficient is known about the ill effects of certain chemicals on the human system, or indeed because such knowledge is deliberately suppressed to make life as difficult as possible for people who are seeking redress for their injuries. Chemical victims encounter what seems to be a conspiracy to deny them justice when they seek redress.